She said she was being followed by a horrible looking ghost. They felt the presence of a ghost and they heard a woman crying. The detective undid the stitches and revealed a sight that would scar all of the officers for life. Have you ever read about a true crime case that stuck with you for days, maybe even months? This is such a case, but believe me, it's a really tough one. Today's story is deeply challenging to all Hello Kitty lovers out there, and to anyone really. What happened in Hong Kong in 1999 is shocking, sad, and pretty hard to believe that a human being can do such things to another human being. This is the story of Fan Man Yi, a desperate woman who turned to desperate measures to support her one-year-old baby and her self-destructive lifestyle. Fan never seemed to get a chance in her life. Bad luck was her middle name. But in 1999, it all escalated very quickly. This wasn't bad luck anymore. It was a vile horror show. Before we go any further, I have to warn you, we'll be discussing mature themes, extreme violence, and death. If that is not something you think you can handle, this is your chance to turn away and check out our other videos. But if you're ready for it, let's dive into the case of the body found inside a mermaid doll. Life had not been kind to Fan Man Yi. She was born in the mid 70s in Hong Kong, but she didn't get the chance at a normal childhood. She didn't grow up with two loving parents, nor did she go to a normal school where teachers care about their students' education and well being. Fan's family lived in extreme poverty and they could not afford to raise a child. So when she was just a baby, her parents abandoned her. Fan was thus raised at an all girls orphanage. But this was not a happy place either. Her carers were mean, neglective, and extremely authoritative. Order was more important than caring for these children or providing them with the right mindset and education to become self-sufficient adults. Imagine growing up knowing your parents have abandoned you with carers that are verbally and physically abusive to you. But even this was better than what happened next. When she turned 15, Fan was basically kicked out of the orphanage. In their opinion, she was old enough to fend for herself and she was just occupying a space the orphanage could have used for an infant. While making room for the newly orphaned children is an honorable intention, sending a young teen with no money and no family out onto the streets is a terrible deed. How were they expecting Fan to get a job and find a home with almost no education or life experience? As soon as she was out of the orphanage, Fan became homeless. Of course, with zero funds, she couldn't rent anything, not even a tiny room. She needed a job, but she didn't know what to do, and she was desperate for cash. Her only solution at the time was to become an illegal street worker. Tragically, this also came together with substance abuse and petty crimes. She stole and sold her body just to have a place to sleep at night. And illegal substances became her only escape, something many young girls from her trade end up doing to pass the time and forget their terrible reality. This was the horrifying start of Fan's life. She had nothing but hardship. Still, things were about to change, or so she thought. It was the mid-1990s and Fan was around 20 years old. She wasn't planning on working on the streets forever and she was pushing hard to get a better life for herself. And at one point, it really seemed like things were getting better for her. Around 1995, Fan was working as a dancer in a nightclub. It wasn't her dream career, but it was better paid and much, much safer than being alone on the streets at night, exposed to whoever is willing to pay. It was at this nightclub that she met a man. He was nice to her, caring, intelligent. They fell in love. And in 1996, the two got married in a small ceremony. Soon enough, the pair had a baby boy. From afar, it looked as if Fan had a stable home for the first time in her life. You might even think she was a happy mom, but there was a dark twist to this story. Both she and her husband were addicts in the worst sense of the word. This meant two things. On the one hand, they would spend all their money on illegal substances and neglect their son in the process. On the other hand, they were in a constant bad mood. This led to constant arguments, 
As months passed, they got so loud that all their neighbors could hear them. Sadly, this was a toxic relationship. They brought out the worst in each other as they fueled each other's addiction and the conflicts only escalated. It was clear the future wasn't bright for Fan or her son in this arrangement. But for the sake of her little boy, Fan was determined to turn her life around. At some point, Fan broke up with her husband and started working on quitting substances. Then her job progressed to nightclub hostess, serving drinks and chatting with men who tipped her from the company. Selling her body was a thing of the past. However, it is worth noting that there are conflicting sources online. Some reports and articles state that Fan was simply working at a brothel instead of on the streets. These might sound like baby steps, I know, but for Fan, being a mother and on the road to recovery was on good news. Compared to the scared little girl from the orphanage, she was now an independent woman who was working hard for a better life. Sadly, her story is about to get as tragic as it gets. Trust me. In 1997, Fan met a 34-year-old man named Chan Man Lok. He had become one of her regular customers, but there was something very dark about him. He was a pimp and a notorious drug dealer, known for his short temper and extreme violence. There's something you should know about illegal nighttime work in Hong Kong. Working as a sex worker is legal, but pimping is not. So many pimps found the loophole of working in real estate, buying whole apartments and converting them into mini flats. They rent out these flats to their illegal nighttime workers at enormous rates, ensuring the women would be forced to continue working for them. It's basically a sort of slave trade, protected by the country's strange laws. Sheesh. So in the late 1990s, Fan got wrapped up in this terrible mafia and was living and working in such a building. Chan Manlock was one of her regular customers and he would visit her in the tiny room where she lived and worked. Unfortunately for Fan, being hard pressed for cash led her to accept visits from virtually anyone but Man Lok was the leader of a triad organization, a Chinese crime syndicate. He was a dangerous person, and Fan was stuck between a rock and a hard place. If she accepted his visits, he might hurt her. But if she didn't, not only would she not get paid, but he might get his revenge on her. Sadly, most of Fan's clients were dangerous men, and she'd just come to accept this as her reality. But in 1999, Fan had a very young boy to feed, and under the pressure from her job and her landlord, she had given in to her illegal substance habits again. As you probably know, people will do crazy things for substance money, simply because they don't think straight and they're desperate for their next shot. But for Fan, this was a fatal mistake. And even fatal seems like an understatement. On a night in March 1999, Chan Manlock visited Fan's room as per usual. He was just getting ready to leave when Fan noticed his big wallet lying on the floor. She'd never stolen from a customer before, but on this night, she felt like this was her opportunity to grab a good amount of cash for her and her son and disappear from that horrible building. So she quickly hid Manlock's wallet under the clutter in her room. She sighed with relief when Manlock simply thanked her and left. He didn't realize his wallet was gone and she thought it would be a long time until he did. Perhaps he would think he'd lost it in the city, Fan hoped. Now, there are a few crazy things about stealing a mafia boss's wallet. One of them was that Manlock was actually Fan's dealer at the time. Another was that Manlock was known for his violence. But Fan could barely afford his substances or feed her young son. She needed much more, and she needed it fast. So now Fan had about 4,000 Hong Kong dollars, about 500 US dollars. She was planning her exit, but sadly she didn't plan it fast enough. As you probably suspect, Manlock didn't assume he'd lost the wallet. On his way home, he stopped at a small supermarket to get a drink, and he realized he didn't have his wallet on him he immediately caught on to what happened. This was a man who beat people over a remark. So imagine how angry he felt when he realized Fan had stolen from him. He rushed back to the brothel, pushed his way through the line and started banging on Fan's door, demanding 
that he be let in. When Fan finally got the courage to unlock her room, Manlock pushed in the door, kicking Fan and grabbed her by the collar. He shouted, wallet, now. Fan panicked and handed him the wallet. She could have acted like she hadn't stolen it as the wallet had simply fallen out of his jeans and got lost in the clutter. But under pressure from the frightening man Locke, Fan admitted she'd taken his wallet and pleaded for her life. This was another fatal mistake. Angered, Fan Locke told Fan he wanted $10,000 interest to pay for her mistakes. Fan didn't have this kind of money. She barely had any money, hence the stealing. So she begged Van Locke to give her time and promised she would have his money soon. He had no choice but to give her time as he wasn't going to take her life in a public place like that. He said he would return and left. The very next day, Van Locke returned to the brothel with the intention to scare Fan some more and demand his money. But she was nowhere to be found. Van Locke felt his pride was being threatened. He wanted to teach Fan a lesson and make it clear to the other illegal workers that no one should dare cross him. He sent out two of his goons, 27-year-old Liang Xingcho and 21-year-old Liang Weilan to get Fan. But they didn't have any amazing means to track people in this city. The two men simply stalked the red light district day and night, thinking that Fan would probably be out somewhere trying to earn some cash. Unfortunately, they were right. Fan was trying to earn some quick money in order to pay their boss back and earn her freedom. So a few days later, the two men found Fan working on a street corner, but they didn't approach her. They called Man Lok and arranged her kidnapping. Man Lok and the two Leongs approached Fan in a car acting like potential clients. Before Fan could recognize Man Lok, the men got out of the car, tied her up and shoved her in their car. They took Fan to 31 Granville Road. In case you're wondering why the street has an English name, Hong Kong was once a British colony. There was a derelict flat with paint peeling off the walls and old pieces of furniture that barely stood up anymore. Manlock's plan was clear. Imprison Fan there, invite fellow gangsters to violate her as they pleased, and they would pay him the money she owed him. This would teach Fan a lesson and the horrible story would travel throughout the red light district as a warning to any other illegal workers. Tragically, this would have been a happy ending for Fan. This was the beginning of the end for her. What she was about to go through during her last month was worse than anything you can imagine. Trigger warning, the next part can get truly upsetting. Skip forward to May 1999 to the Yao Mei Tai police station. A small 14-year-old girl named Ah Fong walked into the station and requested to speak to an officer. She was distraught, her eyes looked tired, and she was very thin. She said she was being followed by a horrible looking ghost and she needed the officer's help with it. She then proceeded to describe the ghost. It was a beaten woman with blood all over her face and body. Her face was disfigured from all the beating and she had electric wires stuck to her wounds. This was the terrifying spirit that was following off Fong and she was desperate to get rid of it. Initially, the police officers who listened to the girl had a giggle. They thought she wanted attention or that she was high. They told her to seek attention somewhere else, but Ah Fong insisted she needed their help. The ghost wailed at her constantly, and it was driving her mad. She was scared for her life. The more the officers listened to her, the more they got tired of her strange story. Eventually, one of the officers picked up the phone to call the girl's parents. That's when Ah Fong urged them to put the phone down. Then she confessed to murdering the ghost. This was the ghost of Fan Man Yi the girl was imagining, and somehow Ah Fong was responsible for her murder. It turns out that the 14-year-old was the grooming victim of Chan Man Lok. He wanted her to pose as his girlfriend, but the police knew better. As they sat down with Ah Fong and listened to her stories, the officers uncovered the most gruesome story they'd ever heard. So in late March of 1999, Fan Mei Yi arrived at 31 Granville Road in Man Lok's apartment. But for him and his gang, this was a reason for celebration. Like a pack of rabid dogs, Man Lok and his two goons drank and consumed illegal substances as they discussed their horrific plan for selling Fan's body 
to gangsters. But as they got high, they also got more violent. They started insulting Fan for stealing the wallet, and then they started slapping her. Soon enough, they were beating her with bamboo sticks and iron rods. These were three psychopathic men who felt zero empathy towards other human beings or any other beings. They knew nothing but violence. And now they were in complete control of Fan's life. So selling her body to other vile men wasn't enough. They would also torment her physically and emotionally. This went on for a month. Fan was no longer Manlock's illegal slave worker. She was his torture prisoner. The men would come to the flat every single day, often taking the then 13-year-old Afong with them. First, he made her watch the unspeakable violence. Then, he made her participate, threatening her that if she wouldn't hit Fan, he would hit her instead. Meanwhile, Fan would also be used in the original plan, seeing gangster clients in order to make money to pay her debt to Manlock. This was the only time when the beatings would stop, at least for a while. Soon enough, men frequenting the area learned about a woman you could be violent toward without getting in any trouble with her pimp. Fan had become everyone's boxing bag. But Manlock and the Leongs inflicted indescribable harm and pain to Fan. And it got so bad that no clients had the stomach to see her anymore. She had been cut with electric wires, she had broken bones, and she literally looked like she was on the verge of death. Instead of being horrified by their actions, the three men got bored with physical torture. So they decided to torment her psychologically instead. They made fans smile and thank them for their treatment of her as she liked it and deserved it. Of course, she refused. It would all get even worse. But no matter what she did, they would treat her in the worst way possible. There was simply no escape for Fan. And by now she knew it. She didn't beg for her life anymore. And perhaps the saddest reason for this was that she didn't have the strength to anymore. Eventually, the monsters realized that they weren't making money off her anymore. It was time to put an end to this horror show. But they weren't just going to take her life in a quick and painless way. They burned her hands and feet so she couldn't walk or use her hands in any way. Then they hung her upside down and used her as a punching bag. And the rest is so gruesome that none of you should even have to hear it. On April 15th, 1999, the gang and young Ah Fong went out to eat and locked Fan inside the bathroom. When they returned to the flat, they checked the bathroom and the inevitable had finally happened. Fan was no longer alive. Apparently, she was in such a bad state that she looked as though she had entered the early stages of decomposition even before her death. The air in the apartment smelled of rot. The hell that Fan had to go through was finally over. But Manlock was enraged. Who had let Fan die? Had one of the goons let his guard down, allowing her to steal drugs and overdose? It's still unclear whether Fan died of an overdose or if she simply and finally succumbed to her awful injuries. It's outrageous that even Manlock did not agree with her dying. The fact that he wanted to keep her there forever and treat her that way simply makes him one of the worst human beings out there. It was finally over for poor Fan, but tragically the monsters were not done with her body. Now they had to dispose of it before any of the neighbors could smell anything. They proceeded to cut the body into tiny pieces and boil them in the same pot they used to cook their meals. Then they threw some of the pieces into the trash. This was their attempt to mask the smell. The other body parts they stuffed in a fridge Sheesh, but not the head. This is where we get to the most infamous part of this case. The gang decapitated the body and boiled the head until all the flesh came off. Then they sewed the skull inside a plush Hello Kitty mermaid doll. This is the picture that made headlines all around the world at the time of its discovery. It's a truly sinister contrast. Hello Kitty is a very cute character that's extremely popular in Hong Kong. A mermaid version of the doll, even cuter. But I'm sure you'll agree with me, the story around this particular doll is worse than any horror movie. That's simply because no movie director has an imagination as dark and messed up as these three men. Fan had 
nothing but hardship throughout her life. She struggled with poverty and a constant feeling of unsafety as she relied on very dubious people for money. But the final month of her life and the aftermath are unfathomable. Back to May 1999, Ah Fong was feeling incredibly guilty every single day, and she was feeling haunted by Fan's ghost. A month and a half after Fan's death, she visited the police station and eventually she told them she was responsible for Fan's death. But the police still didn't believe her. How could a girl who had just turned 14 do all the horrific things she had just described? Perhaps they didn't want to believe this was all true? It would have been much better if it was a sick joke. Ah Fong had no choice but to lead the police officers to 31 Granville Road apartment. Inside, the officers found a dark place with not many apparent clues. That's when Ah Fong showed them the fridge. When one of the officers opens its door, he froze in shock. He realized what the chunks of meat that the fridge was filled with were. Ah Fong had told them this had happened. They simply didn't want to believe her at the time. Then the officers noticed the Hello Kitty mermaid doll carelessly thrown on a mattress. It had some strange marks on it, and while touching it, they realized its head was stiff. The detective undid the stitches and revealed a sight that would scar all of the officers for life. Fan's partially decomposed skull was oozing brain matter inside the dusty doll. This whole story was incomprehensible, even for the police, who deal with violence every single day. But they had no time to waste grieving. They had to catch the monsters. Under the police's protection, Ah Fong told them who they were looking for. Immediately, a manhunt for the three men began. Within 24 hours from Ah Fong's confession, all three men were in custody. The police had found Man Lok enjoying some dim sum at a local diner. Again, he showed zero empathy or remorse for his actions. All three men told the police the same story. They were running an illegal brothel and Fan was working for them of her own accord. But she was a drug addict and died of an overdose. According to them, they only disposed of the body because their activity was illicit. Unfortunately, apart from Ah Fong's confession, which she gave in exchange for immunity, the police had no proof that Fan Man Yi had actually been murdered. However obvious it might have seemed to the police, they simply had no means to prove it in court and charge the men with first degree murder. After a lengthy and tiresome six week trial, the men were found guilty of manslaughter and imprisonment. This meant that they would get a much lighter sentence than the prosecution or the judge would have wanted. Justice Peter Nguyen said, never in Hong Kong in recent years has a court heard of such cruelty, depravity, callousness, brutality, violence, and viciousness. All three men were sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. This was back in 2000, so think about it, they might be walking free as we speak. However, it's highly unlikely they will ever get parole. This is a crime that shook the whole of Hong Kong and anyone who reads about it. It's truly stuff of nightmares. Any parole board will know this. Following the sentencing, Hong Kong slowly began working toward moving on. The horrific 31 Granville Road apartment building was demolished in 2012, and a hotel has been built on the side. But the building wasn't just demolished out of respect for Fan. After the spring of 1999, several people reported very strange incidents inside the building. One family moved into the fourth floor, having no idea about the murder. Within months, they moved out as they felt the presence of a ghost and they heard a woman crying from the flat next door, which was empty. The hair salon on the building's first floor also reported sightings and another resident thought he saw a female ghost on the staircase. Whether these sightings were real and just how much of Fan's tortured spirit remained in the building, we will never know. But one thing's for certain, Hong Kong was ready to tear down this building. As of 2022, the streets are safer for people like Fan. Hopefully nothing like this, nothing even close to this, will happen to anyone ever again. But no matter how much we move on from this tragedy, Fan Man Yi's story should not be forgotten if you ask me. She was an extremely unlucky person who struggled from day one. She did her best to make ends meet, but kept falling with the wrong crowd. Finally, her desperation and need to provide for her son got the best of her. And one last time, she got very unlucky. It's a horrific case and a potential lesson for society to take better care of it's not so lucky. Hey, thanks for watching. As always, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more. 
Till next time and stay safe.